for coming tonight. Um, so uh, my name is Ashley Tolton. I'm an advisor in the Faculty of Science. And we're going to be recording this so that we can post it on our website later. But don't worry, you will not be on the video camera. Um, so uh, tonight we have some other advisors. Um, with us we have Leslie Small from the Faculty of Science. And we have Ramona and Robin from University One. And, um, and then I'll introduce our speakers for tonight. So we have Heather Mandeville. She's the Manager of Admissions and Recruitment. And Dr. Chris Clark is the Associate Dean from um, that school. So they're going to be coming and giving us some information. So I'll hand it over to you to get started. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming this evening, given how horrible the weather is. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, the presentation's kind of in two halves. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the school and talk a little bit about careers in veterinary medicine. And then if you've got a pen and paper, you need to pay attention when Heather starts talking because no one's going to give you an exam question on anything I say. But Heather's is like full of really useful information that you need to know about the admissions process. So a little bit about the school. Um, we're called the Western College of Veterinary Medicine. We refer to ourselves as WCVM, and we're called that for a reason. And the, it goes way back to the 1920s, in fact. In 1922, the first exploratory committee was formed before the, between the four Western provinces to, with the idea of building a vet school. And back then in the 20s, you've got the expansion of Western Canada, you've got the development of agriculture. Some very forward thinking people saw that there was gonna be a need for veterinarians in Western Canada. At that time, there were very few veterinarians and they were either trained in the UK, the US, or were trained at Guelph in Ontario. And so they knew they were gonna need more veterinarians. Unfortunately, things progressed slowly. They hit the Great Depression, then the Second World War came along. So it was like 1956 before anybody really got down to planning. So in 1956, they started planning again. And I apologize to people from Manitoba. Manitoba was never in the offering for where the vet school was going to go. It was either going to be at Edmonton or Saskatoon. They decided that very early on. There was a lot of political infighting that I cannot explain. But the vet school was eventually placed in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan. The key thing to realize is it's not Saskatchewan's vet school, right? The name tells you what you need to know. It actually still is a vet school that exists in partnership between the four Western provinces that happens to be placed at the University of Saskatchewan. So we're as much Manitoba's vet school as we are Saskatchewan's vet school as we are Alberta's vet school as we are BC's vet school. Uh, as our dean sometimes says, we're the vet school for the Western half of the second biggest country in the world. Unfortunately, some of you may have been watching the news in the last two weeks and may have seen some announcements and Alberta has decided to pull out of the partnership. Um, that will start to take effect in two years time. We do not believe that it is going to have any major impact on what we do. It's probably not going to affect you guys at all, except possibly there may be opportunities for more seats. But that's part of the discussion we'll be having with the provincial governments in the, the sort of foreseeable future. So. You know, it's important to realize you're not going somewhere else. You're actually going to Manitoba's vet school. It just so happens that it's not in this province. Um, we're a small to medium sized vet school. If you go to the US and look at vet schools down there nowadays, a lot of vet schools are sitting at around about the 150 students per class. We have 78 students per class. It's a really nice size, actually, because it's kind of the class where you get to know everybody's name. But if you're not getting along with someone, there's enough space that you don't have to interact with them on a daily basis. So it, it's kind of the best of both worlds in that respect. Um, now that I've started speaking, I have discovered that everybody is basically running a book as to where I'm from. And I have discovered that everybody in Western Canada thinks I'm Australian. I am not Australian. I'm actually from the south of England. So I grew up in the south of England. I went to vet school um, at Cambridge University in the UK. Um, at the end of my my studies, I came to Saskatchewan and did a year's internship. Then I went back and I worked in general practice. This is where I used to work. If you've read the James Herriot novels, and I know none of you will admit to it, but I guess you will have, they were set about 60 miles over here. So they were set in Yorkshire. I'm in the north of Cumbria here. Um, I'm so far north in the UK that everything you can see beyond about here is actually Scotland. Like this is right up on the Scottish borders. Uh, Hadrian's Wall starts somewhere over here. So I was there, I was primarily a dairy veterinarian at the time, um, but the dairy farms up there keep all their calves for beef production, so I did beef. They all have a few sheep, which means they all have a minimum of 600 sheep. That's a few up there. Um, they had horses, I did pig work, and then I did, in the evenings we did like the dog and the cat, so it really was like living a James Herriot story. 
and all the accents and all the things used to happen just the same way. I had my car destroyed by a cow at one occasion. Um, now, I'm not just a large animal vet. This is my wife, Kim. She's actually a veterinary radiologist. We have many furry children at home. Uh, the other morning, she was trying to groom the dog and the cat apparently needed somewhere to sit. This was not a staged picture. This is just what our cat decided to do. Uh, my dog does require an introduction in that he is the record blood donor at the vet school. He has given 54 units of blood over time. So he's also the only dog I know that gets like super excited in the morning when he sees me get a leash because he's going to school to give blood and he thinks that's the best thing in the world. All right. Oh, I meant that one out. Um, okay, so I mentioned the vet school was formed as a partnership between the four Western provinces. And the primary reason for forming the vet school was to educate the next generation of veterinarians. Some of the vet school in Saskatoon has done spectacularly well. If you look at our data, the vet school's been in existence since 1965, was the first class that it admitted. Approximately 80% of our graduates are still in the four Western provinces. You know, like we were told to make vets for Western Canada, and that's exactly what we did. Um, if you spend any time, particularly in this province, working with a veterinarian, there's like a 90% chance it's one of our graduates. Like we, Saskatchewan and Manitoba particularly, we sort of have sewn up in terms of our alumni. So we do that very, very well. In addition, we are a center of veterinary expertise. We have um, a quite incredible hospital I'm gonna talk more about in a moment, but uh, every um, year a fair number of animals come from all over Western Canada down into North America and are actually shipped to the vet school for treatment. Certainly, I see a number of horses from around here. We have dogs and cats going into the vet school for cancer treatment, that sort of thing. In addition, our expertise radiates out a little further in the sense that because so many of our alumni are working in practice, when they get complex cases, when they run into things where they're not sure what they're doing, nowadays with electronic communication, it's so easy to send radiographs, send blood work, send digital images, get somebody at the vet school to take a look at them, consult over the phone. In extreme cases, we do have faculty go out into the field and actually meet with our alumni and deal with things, particularly sort of in the farming area where it's easier to go to the farm than bring the farm to the vet school. We also have a really good tradition of research. The research we do in Saskatoon has very much been based on the needs of Western Canada. So given the history of the vet school and, and, it, and its sort of background, a lot of that's been very agriculturally based. A lot of assisted reproductive technology and cattle, a lot of vaccine development, a lot of um, health management strategies around calf health, things like that, pig vaccines. You know, it, it, it's been largely that area, more recently moving into things like um, cancer therapy, um, that type of thing. So, you know, we're a pretty diverse group from that perspective. Now, the word diversity is important here because we know from studies, most people who are thinking about a career in veterinary medicine decided to be a veterinarian before their 10th birthday, right? So they decided young, and there's nothing wrong with that. I am one of those people too. Um, but the reason they decided to be a veterinarian was typically because they had a positive interaction with a veterinarian. So you took your animal to the, your pet to the vet or the vet came out to your farm and you sort of saw somebody and thought, wow, that's a great job. I'd love to do that. And that's fine. That's, that's good. The problem is, is that people often don't recognize how diverse career paths are because they saw someone and thought, I'd like to be like that. But what they're not aware of is how much bigger the veterinary profession can be. Um, we run into this every so often where someone starts at vet school and they've determined they're going to be the world's best cat vet. And that's great. Like the world needs cat vets. It's not going to be me, but we do need cat vets. And they get to vet school and then they're up in my office and they're like, oh my God, but why am I learning pigs? Why am I learning chickens? Why am I having to learn about sheep? And it's because you don't go to vet school to be a cat vet. You go to vet school to be a veterinarian. It's a broad based education and it covers everything. And you don't get very much choice in that matter. And that's a good thing, as you will discover, like understanding the diversity and learning how to interrelate between different species is actually one of the things that really sets veterinarians apart. So it doesn't matter whether you're looking at cattle work, whether it be beef or dairy, uh, you could be looking at other forms of agriculture, certainly swine, poultry. Uh, there's a sort of growing industry in the small ruminant area right now in Western Canada. We need people to do the dogs, the cats, and all the other pets that people have. The list of potential animals that they keep as pets these days just keeps on growing. So you've got all the birds, amphibia, reptilia, you've got all the small, root, uh, small mammals. Nowadays it's teacup pigs are the big thing. 
you do not want to take a teacup pig to a swine specialist. I guarantee you that will not go well. Um, uh, you've got horses, um, you've got research, you've got wildlife and environmental health. You know, those are just some of the broad categories that you, you're going to get some exposure in if you get into vet school. And who knows where your career path will take you. The one thing we do know is people often come into vet school with very, very key ideas of where they're going to go. There's a little bit of resorting occurs during vet school. First three years post-graduation, all bets are off. It's amazing how people end up doing things they didn't anticipate they would be doing. If you'd asked me right up until the end of final year, if you'd asked me once I went back to the UK, I was going to be a dairy vet in the southwest corner of England. And now I'm running the educational program of a vet school in Western Canada. So, and I'm really happy doing it. That's the thing, if you talk to vets, most of them love what they do, but they're probably doing something they didn't anticipate doing. And that, that is actually a really good thing about the profession. Let me just give you three examples that prove this point. First is when NASA was formed in the 50s, and they were going to put men into space, they knew they were going to have to feed them. Now, there were two issues about feeding people in space. One, they wanted to make sure that what they were feeding them met their metabolic needs. Secondly, it had to be 100% safe because no one wanted to get diarrhea in space. They wanted to be able to produce food that they could guarantee would not make people sick. It was veterinarians that designed astronaut rations. And the process they went through to develop food safety is actually now what's used to design slaughter plants. Everybody always complained that astronaut food tasted disgusting, and I have no doubt that it did, because if you got a veterinarian to develop a balanced ration, taste was probably the last thing they cared about. But it was veterinarians that developed astronaut food. Second one was somebody I actually knew. In the 1960s, at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, they did the very first successful human kidney transplants. Now, before they did the first kidney transplants in humans, they developed the technique in dogs. And my old director of studies, Professor Leslie Hall, was an, he was a pioneer of veterinary anesthesia. And so he anesthetized all the dogs that they did the renal transplants on. And when you take a kidney out and put a kidney back in, very strange things happen to blood pressure. And so he had to manage all of that. Then when the surgery was done, as he was the only veterinarian around, was he had to care for the dogs after they'd had a kidney transplant. What that meant was when the first humans had kidney transplants, he actually had to run the anesthesia and he actually had to teach the human doctors how to care for the patient after they'd had surgery. The last one was during the 80s when HIV AIDS was first diagnosed, way before your time I know, but at that time there was a working group started in Washington DC to try and understand what on earth was going on. Almost, I think somewhere in the close to three quarters of that panel were veterinarians because HIV is a retrovirus. No one had ever diagnosed a retrovirus in a human before, so there wasn't a human doctor that even knew what a retrovirus was. It turns out the cat vets had been dealing with them for years. You see, there is a value to having a cat vet at times. And so they were able to actually form the initial working group to study HIV AIDS. So veterinary degrees can take you places you're not aware that they can take you. Um, but having said all of that, 80% of our students will graduate and go into general practice. Private practice is the backbone of the veterinary industry. It's probably the people that you interacted with when you were younger. We broadly split um, veterinary practice into companion animal practice, which is probably 90% dogs and cats. And then everything else is in there too. You know, all those other animals that people keep as pets. Um, this one always catches people by surprise, but more and more, we put horses into companion animals. I know they're an order of magnitude bigger than everything else, but the reason we put horses there is because horses are cared for individually and their medical problems are normally dealt with on an individual basis. The flip side of that is food animal practice. In dealing with cows, dealing with pigs, dealing with chickens, you are dealing with large groups and you are managing the health of a large population. It's that difference between the individual versus the group as much as anything else. And so food animal practice is another great area. Although horses might look like they're the same size as a cow, the way you manage them is largely, it just doesn't compare very well. Mixed animal practice, a number of decades ago, mixed animal practice was 
the key component of veterinary practice. Rural veterinarians used to treat all species like I used to do when I was in practice. It still occurs, don't get me wrong, but more and more you're going to find veterinarians sort of naturally aligning with one particular area. So in a rural area, you may find a mixed animal practice, but maybe there's three veterinarians there, and one sort of does the small animal work, one does the horses, one does the cattle work, right? They got a little bit of crossover, but more and more they're spending the most of their time dealing with one, one particular area of species. And that's because it's just hard to know enough to do everything. It's just very, very, very hard to be that jack of all trades. But it's an incredibly rewarding career. The one thing I'll stress to you, because I've, I've been doing this job long enough, people will often say, oh, I want to be a veterinarian, I love animals. You know, I just love animals so much, I don't get along so well with people. That's not going to work. <laughs> because every animal you ever see as a veterinarian comes with a human, right? And you are going to have to talk to that human. You're going to have to explain things to that human. You're going to have to negotiate with that human about what they're prepared to spend. You're going to have to break bad news to them. You're going to have to console them. You're going to have to be a people person. I don't, it doesn't really matter how much you love the animals. You have got to be a people person to be a successful veterinarian. Talking to people and dealing with people is a huge part of our job. Come on in. Don't worry. Now, outside of traditional private practice, there is opportunity for specialization. Um, specialization within the veterinary field typically is an additional four-year study. So you do your four years to get your DVM degree, uh, you do a one-year internship, and then you do a three-year residency. So internship and residency are essentially postgraduate programs. They're paid. They're not super well paid, so don't get too excited. Uh, you can afford to live and eat, but that's about it. Um, there's a wide, wide, wide variety of specializations, and I'm not going to go through everything in detail. You can certainly specialize in surgery, whether it be small animal or equine. You can specialize in internal medicine, that is dealing with medical issues of internal organ systems at a higher level. Uh, there's eyes, there's skin. Wildlife, if you poll our students, the number of them who want to be wildlife vets is quite spectacular, which is amazing, don't get me wrong. There's just not many jobs. I apologize. There's just not a lot of jobs in wildlife. Each zoo has like one vet and there's like three other people in Canada. So there's probably less than 20 people in Canada doing wildlife. However, many vets in practice as a subspeciality will deal with all the exotic pets. So you get to deal with some really unusual things that way. And it's possible to volunteer at animal rehab, rehab shelters and things like that. So you can still do it sort of on the side, but it's hard for it to be your core money maker. Oncology is cancer, which is a huge developing area right now. The amount of research that's going on in terms of reconstructive surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, etc. There's a lot of opportunities for cancer therapy. If you spend any time in a small animal practice, you'll have seen dental work being done. Dogs and cats is a huge component of especially older pets. The last two I've got up here are interesting because they're probably not on anybody's radar. Nobody thinks about going into vet school to do necropsies and look at specimens under the microscope. Uh, most of you probably don't think of looking at uh, x-rays and ultrasounds and CTs and MRIs all day as being a career choice. But these are really important jobs. They are very, very, very vital to the care of animals. Um, and the other thing is if you start out in mixed animal practice, and you do a lot of calvings at three o'clock in the morning and you get kicked and bitten enough, the idea of working nine till five in a climate controlled room and probably doubling your salary is something that might sort of start making you realize there's something to it. So they're really interesting career paths and it's something to think about. Um, other opportunities, there's a large number of veterinarians work for both the provincial and federal government. I mean, veterinarians play an important role because animal health is so closely aligned with human health. In particular, preservation of a food supply is a vital requirement of government, and veterinarians are obviously in heavily involved in food animal production. Um, interestingly enough, public health agencies like veterinarians because by their nature, they're often taught to talk about, think about groups of animals. Human doctors are trained to look at one patient at a time. 
When you talk public health, you're talking groups. And remember that veterinarians extrapolate between species. So if you ask veterinarians to look at populations of humans, it's just another animal and they just extrapolate and they do it really, really well. So it's interesting, veterinarians get very heavily involved in epidemiology and public health. Um, there's also opportunities in research, if that's what's your thing. We are gonna need the next generation of educators. I certainly never went to vet school thinking I would teach. It's what I've spent most of my career doing but you can do that. There's, there's a number of jobs in industry, whether that's pharmaceuticals, nutrition, uh, aiding in research. Everywhere that does animal research will need to be overseen by a veterinarian. Someone has to care for all those research animals. So there's a lot of opportunities out there from a veterinary degree. This, and it doesn't really matter whether you think these don't interest you right now. It's amazing. If you get into vet school and you do four years in vet school, by the time you graduate, I guarantee your mind will start to change about two years post-graduation. Who knows where things could be, right? So there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, one of the things we're very proud about at Saskatoon is our teaching hospital. I mentioned it already. We have an extremely busy hospital there. Um, and our final year students spend pretty much their entire year on the floor in the hospital caring for patients. So the hospital sees about 15,000 animals a year. Um, about 10,000 of those are dogs and cats. Uh, no, actually probably about 11,000 are dogs and cats. Almost 2,000 are gonna be goodness knows what in terms of exotic pets, all the rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, gerbils, iguanas, bearded dragons, fish, you name it. Um, and then we see about 2,000 horses and cattle combined. Most of the horses and cows are actually dealt with on farm. So we have a really busy ambulatory service. They do about uh, 300, sorry, 3,500 calls a year. They're often looking at groups. So that means about another 30,000 animals in our pool of teaching animals for the students to look at. So about 50% of the animals we see in clinic are first opinion. That is, they've not been seen by another veterinarian. The other 50% are referrals, so they've come in for another veterinarian somewhere in Western Canada for advanced treatments. Uh, we have some incredible facilities there, particularly in the way of uh, medical imaging. We've got uh, ultrasounds, we've got uh, x-rays. We're just about to install a CT machine that is better than any of the ones in the human hospital, which is gonna really piss them off. Uh, <laughs> we have an MRI. The vet school is situated right next to the Canadian light source, which means we have access to the synchrotron and there's some really cool research going on in terms of using that for imaging modalities. Um, I mentioned the cancer therapy. Um, we have a linear accelerator, which means we can do incredibly focused radiation therapy for uh, cancer. We've got access to all the chemotherapy agents. We've got expert certified surgeons who are good at reconstructive surgery. So there's some very exciting things going on there. Uh, we have an equine performance center. I think everybody always thinks, oh my God, a horse treadmill, that's so cool. It's really cool until you actually see a horse on it, then your natural inclination is to just get as far away from it as possible. Watching 500 kilograms of horse gallop on a treadmill and watching that thing shake, just, you know, people just start backing away rapidly at that point. Uh, this is what I used to do. I used to do a lot of cattle lameness work. So this is a hydraulic tilt table, it actually picks the animal up and flips it on its side and uh, gives us access to their feet. In, in dairy cows, it also gives us access to the udder, and in bulls, it gives us really good access to the penis and the scrotum. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really neat tool. Uh, it's amazing, cows just stand there. They don't seem to care. That's why cows are so good. Um, as far as our program goes, I mentioned it's a four-year program. Um, year one is essentially the ologies of how the body works. It's anatomy, it's physiology, it's biochemistry, it's embryology, it's histology. It's understanding how the body system works in the main species that we deal with as veterinarians. Year two, you sort of do that all again, but you're learning how everything goes wrong. So it's learning the infectious diseases, understanding toxicology, understanding the pathological processes that lead to disease. Year three is then essentially how you fix stuff. It's about how you take those things and try to fix them and prevent them. About halfway through third year, we start letting the students pick classes that align with their interests. Um, we don't say, you don't have to like sign up and say, I'm gonna be a horse doctor, and therefore we say, you gotta take these horse courses. You just pick whatever courses you think are interesting. So weirdly enough, 
The second most, com second most popular course in third year is honeybee medicine. Um, so there's some, you know, people get to pick some really interesting and esoteric things there. And then final year is putting it into practice. Final year, you're out of the lecture theater, you're now in the clinic, you're meeting clients at the door, you're taking histories, you're doing physical examinations, you're developing diagnostic plans, developing treatment plans, and depending on the complexity of the case, you're either taking responsibility for the care of that animal, or you're working as part of a team or an assistant in a more complex complex convoluted treatment modality. Um, students can do their entire program at WCVM. There is no requirement for you to go anywhere else, but we know you can't do everything in Saskatoon. So for example, if you're really into fish production, you're not going to be able to do that in Saskatoon. So we have partnerships across Canada where students go and can do externships on the east and the west coast if they want to do salmon or trout farming. Uh, we have students going to zoological parks. We have students going to speciality practices. We have an exchange program with the University of Melbourne in Australia. So th there's a number of opportunities to sort of in enhance learning beyond the walls of the vet school. Uh, we also have an undergraduate research program that I should mention. If, if, if uh, research is something that really interests you, there are opportunities to actually do research programs in the summers and then those can sort of be rolled into the training program in both third and fourth year. So one of the things we are very proud of is the success rate of our program. So the, the NAVLI or the North American Veterinary Licensing Examination is uh, one of the two requirements to practice veterinary medicine in, in North America. The first is you need to graduate from a veterinary school. Second is you need to pass the NAVLI exam. So the NAVLI exam is sat by about 4,000 students a year, mainly in North America, but it also includes the Caribbean vet schools, uh, a number in the UK, uh, Utrecht in Holland, Australia, New Zealand. Some of those vet schools have become involved with this process as well. So we have 78 students or thereabouts per year. The average pass rate is sitting at around 90% for the NAVLI. Our students are sitting at like 97, 98% most of the time. The NAVLI is set in November of final year. You can take it again in March. We, in the last 10 years, every single student that has graduated has already passed the NAVLI. They didn't pass it first time around, they passed it second time around. And if you actually look at our grades, you'll notice that our students are doing well above the average for the worldwide. In fact, we're about one standard deviation over the mean, which if you've done Z scores and everything else, puts us in about the top 20% of veterinary colleges. So we're very, very proud of the success of our program. Part of the reason for that success, there's no doubt we have exceptional students. As Heather's going to break your heart in a minute and tell you that we have about 460 applicants for 78 seats. So we get some very, very, very talented students. They're um, great people to get to know. They're, they're incredibly dynamic and committed to what they're doing. In addition to all their studies, they get involved and form clubs and societies and they supplement their own educational experiences that way. Wide variety of clubs at the school. Uh, just a couple of things I'll mention. This is um, uh, a volunteer run program which takes place twice a year up in the, the community of La Ronge. La Ronge is about five and a half hours drive straight north of Saskatoon. It's a large Indian reserve. Um, does not have a veterinarian up there, but a lot of people live up there. There's a lot of pets. So we basically head up there and set up a mash unit in the hockey arena. So this is the OR area. Um, the students will, well, we were up there in, eight, in August. Um, they did 90 surgeries in two and a half days and saw about another 120 animals. So very, very, very busy. Um, a huge opportunity to learn and give back to the community. Um, Global Vets and Vets Without Borders are two of the sort of development agencies that veterinarians are involved with. This is one of our students two years ago out in Uganda. She was involved in a program to bring dairy goats to rural villages to provide milk for children. Because in those areas, there's a real protein deficiency problem. And so having milk for young children, I have to be really careful not to say kids because then everybody gets really confused. But they're using the milk for children um, to prevent protein deficiency. And this actually was one of our grads, Steve. He was very involved in that. He now lives in Nicaragua. He's involved in a global charity that's involved in trying to stop rabies transmission to humans. 
So he's involved in developing spay neuter programs to stop stray dog populations and vaccine programs to try and minimize biting and rabies transmission in the developing world. So the, you know, veterinary medicine can take you some pretty interesting places. Um, just quickly mention, I know you, if you're here this evening, you really want to know about the veterinary undergraduate program. We do have veterinary degrees. You can do specialities at WCVM. Uh, we do have a couple of combined degree programs too. If research is your thing, there is a way to combine a DVM with a research degree. The masters can often sometimes be fitted in at the same time. If you use your summers wisely, you may be able to get an MSc at the same time as a DVM. A PhD is going to add at least two, if not three years to the overall program. But for some people, that's a really good opportunity. The other thing is we've partnered with the um, Edwards School of Business on the university campus. And uh, we actually offer an MBA program, a Master's of Business Administration combined with the DVM. I know most people just like, go, why would you do that? But you'll hopefully remember back 80% of our graduates go into private practice. Right? Those are big businesses that someone needs to run and understand what they're doing in. And an MBA is a very, very, very good tool if you find yourself working in that kind of environment. It's a great deal, actually, because it's a 12-month program, but you get it at half price if you do it through the vet school. So there's a pretty sweet deal there, actually. So um, you know, the thing about being from Manitoba is you really only have one choice. Fortunately, it's a really good choice. Right, WCVM, we got great facilities there. We got a really dedicated faculty and staff. Um, we are a very busy hospital. You've seen that. We got a great track record. Cost-wise, we're one of the cheapest veterinary programs in North America. Our tuition is just over ten thousand dollars a year. Um, you know, if you're down in the states looking at out-of-state tuition, you're going to be looking at sixty thousand dollars a year. So it's it's a pretty good deal. And we allow people to develop the program to suit their interests, which is really, really important. We're not telling you on day one what you're going to be. We're letting you kind of find out for yourselves and pick what you want to do. Um, if you've never been there, the University of Saskatchewan, I, it always makes me think of a little bit of the U of M. Like they're, they're, they're similar in many respects, right? They're, they're the big um, provincial university. We are perhaps even a little more diverse because um, every single major um, speciality is on the same university campus. So we actually have medicine, human medicine, vet medicine, nursing, dentistry, physiotherapy, and pharmacy all on one site, which is really unusual in North America. We've got engineering, we've got agriculture, we've got law, we've got business. Everything is on one site, which makes us a pretty diverse area. Uh, it's a really pretty campus. Um, I don't think our vet students know that much about campus, to be brutally honest with you. They tend to stay at the vet school. They can, if pushed, find their way to geology, only because that's where Tim Hortons is. Otherwise, they don't seem to know much about the campus. Um, Saskatoon, it's a relatively small city. The, the population of the main city is about a quarter of a million. There's about another 100,000 people living immediately around Saskatoon. But given how small it is, there is nowhere else near it. So everything you could possibly want, you find in it, right? It, it, it's got way more in it than you would expect for a city of its size because there is just sort of nowhere else around it. Um, there's lots of student accommodation. It's really easy to get around because it is a small city. I'm always sort of struck by how long it takes to drive across Winnipeg because I've lived in Saskatoon so long. I just assume you can get from one side of a city to the other. Our rush hour is like 10 minutes. It's, it's a great place to get around. Um, Climate-wise, it's actually very similar, I think, to here. It's a little colder, but you get less snow. And apparently, we, are the, we have more hours of sunshine than anywhere else in North America. It may be minus 40, but apparently the sun is shining. So we always have to put this slide in, because we have to also present in uh, Vancouver. I'm trying to explain to them what winter actually is. We were there. We were there Monday, and it, what, what was the temperature outside? I, I know I was walking around like this, and people have got winter jackets and toques on. <laughs> so they get very nervous when we discuss the temperature. Anyway, um, at that point, I'm going to pass it over to Heather. And if you've got a pen and paper, you may want to get it out, because this is where you may want to start taking notes. All right. Can everybody hear me? 
Perfect. Um, so I'll go through the admission requirements. Feel free, if you have any questions at all, put your hand up. There's no use waiting till the end and running the risk of forgetting what you might want to ask. So uh, we'll start just with uh, basically the basics of admission. So as Dr. Clark mentioned, we're the Western College of Veterinary Medicine. So the first thing that we actually look at before any academic information or anything else with your application is your residency when you apply. Um, our residency guidelines are actually set out by the provinces. So every five years, the provinces get together, uh, negotiate an interprovincial agreement, and they go through and make sure if there's any changes they want to make to the residency guidelines, they're made. So um, there's sort of two broad categories. It usually fits most people. Um, if you've gone from high school straight into university and you haven't interrupted your studies with more than 12 years being outside of school, you're considered dependent upon your parents and then where they live is what you're considered for residency. So even if you were to go out to Dalhousie, if your mom and dad are here in Manitoba, you'll still be considered a Manitoba resident. On the flip side, if you've spent 12 months out of um, school after graduating high school and you haven't gone to any post-secondary during that time, where you live for that 12-month period is what we would consider your residency. So you're now independent of your parents. Um, when it comes to residency, we decide that at the point that you apply. So December 1st is our application deadline each year. Um, so if you stop school, say in May, it wouldn't actually come into effect if you've changed your province until the next year when you apply. Um, our quota, so we take, is everybody in the room from Manitoba? Is there anybody not? Good, where are you from? BC. BC? Okay, perfect. Um, so we take 20 students from BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, 15 students from Manitoba each year. We do have two seats set aside for students of Indigenous ancestry, so that can be Inuit, Métis, First Nations, and we do require proof of a card um, to apply for those seats. Uh, the key with the two uh, seats reserved here is that those students aren't just considered for those two seats. They do have to be Western Canadian residents, so they are also considered in their home province. Um, accordingly, we actually see about four or five Indigenous students in each of our four years of the VET class. So usually two or three will come in in their home province, and then there's the two that come in through our equity seats as well. Uh, the one other seat that we have is most often uh, occupied by somebody from one of the three Northern Territories. We do have provision within our guidelines that if we have an applicant who has sort of a messy residency history based on either themselves, their parents, or their spouse being tied to the military or RCMP, and they keep getting relocated because they're told they have to, uh, they can also qualify to apply for this one other seat that we have. So in total, we have usually about 450 applicants. Uh, more specifically, if we're looking at the Manitoba pool, that number sits probably around 65 to 70 students each year. Um, in terms of BC, probably about 120 is what we see applying from there. So the selection criteria, there's really two basic things that uh, are looked at, academic requirements and the non-academic. Um, but actually the academic are the first thing that definitely gets you to the non-academic stage. So when you apply, um, we have our prereq checklist and if everybody picked up a brochure, it lists in the back cover how many credits of each subject area are required. Um, we don't use the prereqs alone in calculating any average, so they factor into the overall average that we, we use in our um, academic score. So all courses ever taken, university level courses, will work into that average. It actually is weighted two thirds of this 60% score, so we will take it to a score out of 40. Uh, the minimum required is a 75% to apply. Realistically, to be competitive for an interview, probably an average closer to 80 or 81 is what's necessary. And then the second average that we use, your best full year, that's weighted a third. So we take that score out of 20 actually in the 60 points. So when I say 81, 82, that usually means those people have a best full year, probably around 87, 88 to be competitive. Um, our BC numbers are a little bit higher. So when we're talking about an interview offer to, to be competitive, probably closer to an 82, 83 with a high year of about an 88. So. So yeah, as far as best full year, um, when we're defining a best full year, we just look at September to April courses. 24 credits is the minimum. We quite often will get a lot of questions about uh, do you need to have 30 credits or 24 credits in, to be considered a full year. Um, our preference is definitely to see students able to handle 30 credits. Uh, the VET program in first year, for example, has 42 credits in total. So students who've always done 24 credits or less in their academic years going through their pre-VET years, we know have a bit of a difficult time when they come in and are faced with 42 credits. Um, we do have the flexibility though, with that being said, in our score that we use. So um, if your best year is 24 credits, it will be used here. 
but ideally we would like to see you at some point in your pre-vet years have done five, to five and five courses in back-to-back -back terms. So yes, the academic score is how you get to this next stage. Uh, when you apply, we don't actually go through within the admissions office your animal experience, your vet experience, any of those parts of your application, your reference letters. Um, it is straight numbers and the academic score that we use to rank students and decide who gets an interview offer. So we interview two people for each seat that we have. So for example, in Manitoba, the top 30 based on this score, then proceed to the stage to have an interview offer and have a 40% score applied. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the non-academic score does encompass both the interview and references. Uh, the references aren't formally scored. What they're actually used for is the everybody who's offered an interview, we put a subset of their application together and that's background information that will go to the interviewers. So the fre reference forms that you have with your application will go to the interviewers and they'll get to know a little bit more about you and their questions will then center around what your background has been. <coughs> Sorry. Um, academic requirements, uh, hopefully everybody picked up a brochure. There's 60 credits in total that are required to apply, uh, which is 20 courses. Of those, you'll see that uh, 39 credits are quite specific, the biology, chemistry, physics, and so on courses. Uh, there's 21 credits of that are open electives. So when you're choosing those, they can be any university level courses. I would strongly suggest that you have a backup plan that's a degree um, in your pre-vet program. So pre-vet itself isn't usually a program and it doesn't get you a credential at the end. Uh, from our perspective with the large number of applicants we see, um, majority of students will go on to do three years or even four years before they're admitted to the vet program. So about 10 people each year come into the first year class with just two years of pre-vet. So definitely having a degree as your backup plan that you're working towards so that if you aren't accepted, say the first time that you apply, that you have something naturally that you progress in your third and fourth year towards. Um, as far as a preferred backup plan, uh, we get off, often asked, do we have a preferred? Um, I think there's a lot of myths, especially at universities that have both animal science and science programs, that agriculture or animal science is the preferred program. Uh, we actually see almost equal number of students coming from both backgrounds. So really, when you're picking your backup plan, I would say pick what you prefer. And if you didn't get into vet med, what's going to open the door for you as far as a career that you're satisfied with, not trying to pick a program that you think the vet school wants to see. Uh, prerequisites, I won't go through these in great detail, um, unless, does anybody have any questions about prerequisites specifically? If anybody has, tr oh yeah. Um, yes and no. There are some variations and it's for that reason why I know quite often it's like why don't you just put them all on the website with a number of institutions and then within even like a university here where we kind of have a different list for science versus uh, animal science students. Uh, definitely the email address in the second back page there. Email Shauna and she has a listing of all the courses from University of Manitoba that we accept and I won't even pretend that that list is all inclusive because definitely with things like our math and stats we're pretty open as long as you have six credits of university level math stats or three of both then we're we will accept those so if somebody's in a business or an engineering program we probably haven't included them on our list so don't think if you have something if you question it definitely feel free to send in the course description yep No, so the question was, do prerequisites expire? They do not, so they can be 10 years old, 20 years old. Uh, most people, they are within you know, a certain number of years of applying, but there isn't a limit. Yeah. Uh, the other comment I was gonna make, if anybody has international baccalaureate or advanced placement transfer credits that they got from high school subjects for university courses, um, if you got the transfer credit at the university, then those will be accepted as well for prerequisites. So references, we require two references when you apply. Uh, one of them has to be a veterinarian. The second one can be anybody from an animal or an agricultural related background. Uh, the form that you see up here is actually the form that we have references complete. Uh, it's no secret, it's on our website. So when you're choosing your references, if you wanna make sure that you've looked at the form and they know you well enough to complete it, by all means you can do that. Um, if you wanna name two veterinarians as references, that's definitely fine. 
I just like to remind people that keep in mind what they're being used for. So sometimes using two veterinarians isn't as advantageous as you think it is because they are both vets. Um, I would say really what provides the most background about your experiences that you have is more important because they are going to the interviewer and they sort of give them a glimpse of sort of the different areas that you spent your time in. So. Um, as far as the references go, you just name them on your application, you put their email address and everything else is automated. They'll get sent a form to fill in uh, right online and you can see on your application as they're completed, the date will show up by the person's name. So if February 15th is getting close and you notice your reference isn't in, uh, we start nudging them. We hope that you start nudging them as well. Uh, we don't, we've been pretty kind. We've never just thrown an application out. They are mandatory that we have them in, but we will give you the opportunity if somebody just isn't sending the form in to um, you either bother them or name a new person if necessary to fill out the form. Uh, so interview, we use an interview as I mentioned, so that's weighted 40% of the admission score that, that works into the rank. Uh, the interview we use is a panel style in sort of traditional interview. Uh, it's usually 40 to 45 minutes. There's three people on the interview team. So two of those will be members of the admissions committee um, at the WCVM. The third person varies a bit. So we, when we offer interviews to students that are not Saskatchewan residents, um, they will be given the option if they want to interview in Winnipeg, for example, or come to Saskatoon for their interview. So the third person that sits on the interview team will vary depending on your location. Um, the Manitoba Vet Med Association names this person who sits on the team. They typically only attend the interviews though that happen in Winnipeg. So if you come to Saskatoon for your interview, uh, we have one person who acts as sort of that floater for the Alberta, the Manitoba and the BC interviews in Saskatoon. Um, otherwise, the other two people are the same and the composition of the questions and everything else with the interview really is identical. There isn't a, a advantage or disadvantage to picking one place over the other. Um, if you've never been to Saskatoon and never seen the vet school, definitely probably worthwhile coming out for an interview. Dr. Clark gives uh, tours every day that interview, interviews are on of the hospital and the teaching space around the building. So, And as mentioned, so we interview two people for each seat we have. So out of Manitoba, there will be 30 interviews granted. Um, out of BC, we'll grant 40 interviews each year. Um, so what qualities are assessed in the interview? Um, these two areas here, animal related experience, veterinary uh, experience, insight into the profession, probably not a surprise that that's, that's the bulk of the interview and that they really want to get to sort of the quality of the experiences that you have. There's no question or requirement for you to refer to the quantity number of hours that you've spent and they actually will really try to get away from even knowing that information. It's more about how engaged you were, what you learned in those experience, experiences, pardon me. Um, Ideally, they'd like to see people cover off on more than one area of veterinary medicine. So as Dr. Clark talked about the diversity um, and what those areas are, I would say kind of think of the way that he presented, say, companion animals versus the food animals. There's zoo animals, there's the research, there's, you know, the broad areas like that, wildlife. Um, I think cats and dogs, if those are your two areas, probably aren't broad enough. They are still both falling into that companion animal area. Um, and that's not absolutely necessary that everybody has two areas, but I think to do well in the interview, definitely having more than one area covered will be to a benefit. So uh, communication skills, that's obviously important in most interviews. You should be able to speak and hopefully get what you've done across in the interview. Uh, 40 minutes does tend to go by very quickly. I know the students come out of the 40 minute interview and feel some of them like, uh, they had more to say. So for some people practicing interviews, either with a pre-vet club, with a vet that you're volunteering with, might be useful just to sort of get a relaxed feel for 40 minutes and trying to get a lot of information out if you need to. Um, you know, concentrate on getting things concise. The third category in the interview, we sort of lump these things all together. So citizenship is the broad category that sort of includes everything outside of animal and vet experience. Um, ideally a well-rounded person so that can be almost anything some people are very involved with sports music travel church activities volunteering in the community anything like that um, that you do outside of your animals is what sort of the citizenship category will focus on leadership roles that you've taken on uh, knowledge of current events and what's going on in the world all definitely useful if you're a reader those kind of things um, 
there isn't a template. I know a lot of times people are looking for what exactly it is that they need to do to do well in the interview. If you saw our first year class, you would realize that as diverse as the profession is, so is the first year class. There is no like right answer. Um, I think we have somebody who competed or tried out for Olympic team. We have everything from engineers to doctors to fine art majors. There's everything in musicians. musicians yes, isn't there a course? They have a chamber orchestra at the moment. Yeah. There's a, is it a baby grand piano that's in the? Or? No, it's just an upright piano. Oh, just an upright, yeah. Yeah, the college is an interesting place. Behind every elevator sort of tucked is uh, in the little corridor. You'll find a foosball table or you'll find a piano, but there's always a lot of social activities going on in the college. So it just sort of speaks to the diversity of the students and realizing, you know, do the things that you do really because that's who you are, not because you think the vet school has a preferred list of what they're looking for in people. So. so just to get into a little bit more, so what I, trying to show you here is um, how our ana or, pardon me our academic rank and our interview score do not correlate at all and if they did we wouldn't spend a lot of time doing the interviews like we do so we put up here now this is the Saskatchewan pool um, just a few years ago so there's 40 people listed here this number down the left is actually the rank order based 60 percent on their academic score and 40 percent on their interview score the number that you'll want to compare this to is this middle column. So this was their academic rank alone. So what you'll see is somebody who is number one overall with their 60 and 40 scores combined was number eight based on academics alone. So we've highlighted just a few lines. This one's not extremely noteworthy, the pinkish line here, but basically this was our highest ranked student based on grades. So definitely somebody in the 90s or an A plus average who applied did decently well, 27.4 out of 40 on their interview. So their overall score took them down to the ranked position of six. This is Saskatchewan, as I mentioned, so as long as you're in the top 20, that's the key, because you will be offered acceptance. But the other two lines sort of highlight to you what are the two extremes that can happen with applicants, and not to discourage anybody, um, but we'll show you that basically the person who came in, or the person who did come in with the lowest academic score, they ranked number 40 based on their grades, did very well on the interview, pulled themselves up 24 ranked positions and were offered a seat in vet school. The flip side, kind of depressing, but don't get depressed because I'll have a good message at the end here. That person was number five. So I always like to tell people because for some reason, especially in high school students when I talk to them, they think that an 89 might not be high enough for vet men. They're going to just disclude themselves right now and I'm going to go into vet tech. Vet tech's good and if you want to do it, do it. But don't not do vet med because you think that 89 is required or not even high enough. So this would have been probably about an 89% average student. They were ranked number five based on their grades. And sadly, their interview score didn't go as well. They got 18 out of 40 and pulled themselves down 25 ranked positions. So the good news with this is Dr. Clark does lots of analysis and stats. And we know that the average person getting into vet school goes through 1.9 or two interviews. It's actually not that common that people get in with just on their first interview. So these people in this group here is where we spend most of our time when it comes to writing letters at the end and giving information back to people. We know they're a very highly gifted academic group of people and they will do well in the vet school. Where they're lacking is just the area of their interview. So we try to get the comments, or we do get the comments right out of the interview committee. We formulate them into a letter. We're happy to talk to people on the phone if they're in Saskatoon, meet with them, and give you information on what you can do to improve yourself for next time when you apply. So we don't try to be gatekeepers and discourage people from applying again. Definitely, I think the information, you know, especially for this person, it is their interview. So um, some of these people, you know, it's borderline. Definitely, if you were sitting number 35, your grades could come up because your interview is decently well. We know that 27.4 could get you in, but the grades just weren't high enough for that person. So there's a lot of detailed feedback that we can give people if you're not successful the first time you apply. The other thing about that is I like to encourage people. I know sometimes people get into a backup program and they've named biology and they're loving it and they want to finish that degree before they apply to vet med. I would, my advice to people is knowing that it takes most people two interviews, probably waiting to the last year of your degree, your fourth year of your degree isn't always the best, best method because you do have to consider you might then have an interrupted year if you don't get accepted the first time. So, you know, even if you have that mentality, I want to finish my degree, it might be not a bad thing to apply in your third year. 
if you got accepted to vet school, I think the dilemma is, is a good one to have. It's either finish my degree or go to vet school. Um, we don't usually grant deferrals for people to finish an undergrad degree. So if you decided really that your, your undergrad was important, then you could decline your offer and then apply again the next year. So the application process, everything is online. Our application goes live, I think about a month ago, so mid-September. We uh, close everything December 1st, so midnight Saskatchewan time, which I'm trying to think, will we be the same as Manitoba by December 1st? Yes, so it'll be midnight here as well. Um, everything locks up, so please, I know every year there's people that we see the stats and they're like two minutes to 12 when they hit submit and it's like, why do you wait? But you can. You, just be careful that things can sometimes go wrong. Uh, transcripts, if you've only attended University of Manitoba and you're attending here this year, there's nothing you need to do right at the December 1st application deadline. Uh, we will send you a reminder in January and April asking you to send in your transcripts once your grades from December and April are both reported. Um, on the other hand, if you've gone to another university, say you went to University of Winnipeg for your first year or something and now you're here, the Winnipeg transcripts you could send now if they're complete or at this December 1st application deadline. Um, if you've applied before and you had other institutions that you attended and you've already sent those transcripts, we do keep those on file usually for three years, so there's no need to have those ones resent. Um, references, as mentioned, they're due mid-February. Interviews. Um, yeah, so one of the comments I don't think I went into detail about the interviews is we make interview offers in a couple different rounds. So once we get all the grades in in January from the September to December courses, we use our formula with the two-thirds overall average, one-third best full year to rank everybody. We will count your current year that you're in as your best full year. At initially, when we're making our first round of interview offers, we hypothetically assume that if you were an 88 at Christmas time, that's where you're going to stay for the whole year. So we will offer uh, two thirds or about 20, 20 of our interview offers mid April before we have all your grades in. Um, and then the remaining one third of the interview offers, we do hold back until May 15th um, to offer those ones because we wait until all the grades are in completely so that we, we can adjust the second term grades and the average as need to be. So. Um, interviews will take place. Usually, the, There's usually a couple of options if you're offered in the earlier set. Um, everybody can pick whether they want to come to Saskatoon or Winnipeg. The earlier set, if you come to Saskatoon, will be held the beginning of May. Um, all the ones in Winnipeg are always held the last week of May. And then if you're offered in the later set and you choose Saskatoon, there will be a June date as well for the Saskatoon ones. So. Um, as far as final notification, our admissions committee gets together usually within a few days of interviews wrapping up. So usually by June 10th, we, uh, we're pretty successful in getting letters out. So everybody who applies, all 400 or 450 applicants will get notified on the same day on their WCVM application. The letter gets posted there with your acceptance or if you're on the wait list, which we would put two people each year from Manitoba in case somebody declines or is deferred entry for a year. Um, or your decline letter, all those are all posted on the website once at one time. So um, the one thing about that, if you're one of those obsessive people that you know they're coming out around June 10th and every 10 minutes you're logging in to see if the letter's there, you don't need to. As soon as they get posted to the website, we send a blast email out to the entire applicant pool saying the letters have been released. So you don't have to get too neurotic. All right, I think that concludes sort of our formal presentation. We're happy to stay around as long as you want to. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, we're happy to answer any questions um, if you want to ask as a group, and if you have something that you'd prefer just asking one-on-one, -on -one, we can do that after, too. So. And just a quick thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Today. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Matches your so shirt. Can, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> thank we you. Can, Walk through you better weather. Oh, no, that's okay. We have the same thing in Saskatchewan, so it's actually not a, the end of the world. Anybody any questions? Everybody's too embarrassed to ask in front of the group. Heather and myself have no other plans, so we can hang around <laughs> at the front here and answer your questions one on one. I have a question about yeah. summer session. Yes. How Just in general? Yeah, well, you know, it wouldn't count as part of their best year, correct? Right. It yeah. would just count in the first calculation. That's right. Okay. So it's in their overall average if it's a prerequisite, and we quite often see people deciding that physics is something that stresses them out and pulls away from other classes. 
Um, it's not uncommon that we see people put physics in their summer course, for example. Um, definitely as far as prerequisites, it will be accounted for and accepted. Um, those can be taken any time, the prerequisites. Um, but yes, it only works into the overall average, not their best. And one. you can have up to two courses in the summer scheduled for the year you get into vet school. As long as we get your grades by June 30th, okay. you can actually get prereqs done at the very last minute. That, that is something we do a lot. Do you often see students with summer session? Like I'm just like strategically, would you take your weakness in the summer? Um, I think people, yeah, once they realize that works, that it can be definitely strategic. Um, the other thing is, is I think for two-year students sometimes applying, depending on the university, it is sometimes difficult for them to get all 60 credits of required courses done. So having that window of May, June that they can have up to six credits carry past April 30th is a nice, allows them to apply in a two-year timeline where they might not have if, they, if it was April 30th. So. Thank you. Yep. Come on, there has to be something else. Please ask it, because otherwise I'll get 30 emails with the same question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you know, like, do you have statistics of the people who apply as far as like overall average and, and that kind of thing? Do you have like anything you ever release? Um, we're a little bit careful with what we, we release. Uh, there's a lot of diversity across our four applicant pools, and we have this tag that we call province hoppers. So where BC and Alberta tend to be quite a bit more competitive for interview offers, that being too transparent with some of the information just encourages a lot of people. And I think if you understand the way the funding works from the provinces and the provinces commit a lot of money to educating students for their province, and that's why the residency guidelines are as tight as they are, um, that we are a little bit you know, careful. Definitely, you know, what the cutoff is for each province, we're happy to give you that information so that it helps people with setting goals and knowing, you know, realistically whether they're competitive or not. Sometimes they decide, you know, a 75, I would never say don't apply, but I think for some people, if they give $100, the application fee is a lot of money, then I can tell you that yes, 75 hasn't unfortunately been offered an interview for as long as I've been with the vet school and I don't think we see numbers coming down. Does that help you a bit? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. And the other thing that gets complicated is because it's a 40-20 it's a split, right? The, the GPA is worth 40 of those points, but your best full year. So some people do a spectacularly good year, and so their, their average would be lower, whereas other people, their best full year and their average may actually be the same. And, and so that complicates it. The other thing, just to put, put it in perspective, is what you need is a good enough grade to get to it. Like if you look at the numbers that were up on the board there, you'd have seen that the highest academic mark out of 60 was at 58, and the lowest person interviewing was actually about a 44, so there was a 14 point spread on the academics. Last year there was a 30 point spread on the interview. So if you can get to interview, you can make it into vet school, because the interview can really balance that out that you already saw. And you can have the best grades in the world and not get in because the interview didn't work for you. But if you don't get in the first time and your grades are still the same, look at the feedback, act on the feedback, and almost everybody's interview goes up the second time around, which is why we're sitting at about 1.9 interviews for a person who gets in. So if you make it to interview, you can get in. The other thing we didn't mention, so I don't know if anybody's in the position where they've had a bad year of university. I'd be surprised. I think everybody has that. But for some people, um, definitely having a real outlier in a year. We do have a forgiveness policy that can come into place. Um, it's not the most generous policy, but I think it's fair for across the board. Um, at the point that a student has five full years of university, and by five full years we mean that credits have to add up to 150 credits, uh, we will consider removing an earlier year. Um, it's not an automatic process, so there's sort of three criteria the committee will look for. The first one being is they want to see three higher, more current years. The second, definitely a preference for 30 credits per year, not just 24 credits per year. And then the third thing is they will scrutinize the level of courses that you're taking. So I always give the example, if you finish a four-year degree, go back and do a fifth year of all 100 level courses, they're not probably going to remove an earlier, not probably, they won't remove an earlier year. That's 
pretty much obvious. Um, but if you do upper level courses in a fifth year and you had like your first year was a 69, you moved up to a 75, and then you're pulling off three years in 80s, definitely that would make a case to remove an earlier year. Um, if you're in that position, I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation because I like to make sure we're setting you up for not disappointment. And when you're planning your fifth year, I'm happy to go through the courses you're planning to take for your fifth year. And if we identify anything that looks like it's too junior or you're repeating a whole bunch of courses you already took, um, then I can get you to switch them around and we'll make the strongest case that we can so that you could have a year removed. So. Occasionally, we will remove two earlier years, but that's not till the point that you get to six full years. So I know it has happened. We've had people who have a second career choice. So if their first career was engineering, the likelihood that their marks will be competitive for vet school quite often out of engineering are less likely. We don't, um, but then if they switch into another degree, you know, having two of those earlier years possibly of engineering grades removed, and then they have other grades are definitely higher in more current years will work to their advantage. Got a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you mentioned B. Yep. Medicine. Yep. Um, what are some of the other courses that you can take that are interesting? Like <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, B medicine, it, it, it seems strange in North America. One of the things that's happening is there's a lot of legislation coming down about the use of antimicrobials and hives often get diseases and have to be treated. And only veterinarians are going to be able to prescribe antimicrobials soon. And so veterinarians are going to have to know something about bee medicine. Um, we, so that, that's where that one exists. Um, we do um, some ecosystem health courses. That's actually a combined rotation with the other vet schools in Canada. Um, there's um, aquaculture. Um, there's exotics. There's poultry. Um, there's uh, a social determinants of health course, which relates to two things that sort of agriculture in developing nations. Um, I think what else we've done is a bit more unusual. Um, those are some of the key ones, I would say. Most of the other ones probably are more the type of thing you expect, you know, advanced, <laughs> advanced feline medicine, small wound introduction, uh, food animal surgery. Small animal orthopedics, advanced anesthesia, that kind of thing. Have you done any like uh, physiotherapy at all? Oh, actually, thank you. Yes, there is. <laughs> uh, we actually have two full-time um, physiotherapists, rehab specialists at the vet school. Um, so we actually have a fourth-year program where you can do rehab and physiotherapy, and they're using laser therapy and acupuncture and some degrees of chiropractic and things like that as well. Yes? Is it very competitive to work in equine medicine? Oh, okay, so the question if you didn't hear it was, is it very competitive to work in equine medicine? It's a complex question. Um, there's a lot of horses in Western Canada. A lot of vets do some horse work. The clients in Western Canada, this is not criticism, they just, typically people in Western Canada do not spend a ton of money on their horses. So there are certain parts of the world where it's incredibly competitive to work in equine medicine. Um, you know, the ones that spring to mind are like areas around Kentucky and Newmarket, uh, around the Woodbine Track in, in um, Ontario. In other areas, um, it, it really depends on what you want to do. If you want to be an equine surgeon, there's quite a lot of competition there. If you want to do horses in a rural area, they're always looking for people to do that sort of thing. Um, uh, there's people sort of specializing in advanced, uh, uh, reproductive technologies with embryo transfer and, and artificial insemination. If, if you're interested in horses, there are some key opportunities for you. And I think our program sets you up very well for that. We have an incredibly busy equine field service program. So there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of veterinarians there to get talking to about that. I mean, it always makes me laugh when people ask, is it competitive to get into equine medicine? The reason I sort of laugh is my speciality is large animal internal medicine. And I got in into it for cattle work. And the joke was when I left vet school, I would never touch another horse. And I ended up doing more than 50% of my time doing horse work, even though I was never a horse person. So you, yeah, there are, there are jobs out there. It's not, it's not the most competitive. If you just want to do horse work, if you want to do surgery, that's where, that's where the competition comes in. Because the residencies are very hard to get into.